Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth Global Dialogue Asia Europe series, Show Innovation for Resilience, the Taiwan Approach. I'm your host today, the Asia Lead of Show Innovation Exchange, Six. Today, we have more than 100 people joining us um, from around the world, from the Netherlands, Nepal, Myanmar, Morocco, of course, UK, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So let me talk a little bit uh, what Six does. So Six is an international exchange started more than a decade ago. We are found to help identify and connect isolated people and organization within social innovation field. Filled by the belief that change is more effective when people work collectively. So over the 10 years, we have created a lively and impactful exchange between social, socially innovative thinkers and doers. So I am very privileged that during my time in London, uh, I got to work at SIX to get connected with social innovators from around the world and curate different experience to grow the social innovation movement. So we, Audrey just dash off, but I'm sure she'll get back in uh, soon. Just keep talking, Mark. I'm sure everything will be fine. Okay. So six is known as a convener or connector. We have curated a lot of events, learning circles, or other activities to facilitate exchange and conversations. So this series is um, part of our bigger work on building the Asia social innovation narrative. So currently, Currently, social innovation practice in Asia are largely influenced by the US, UK, and the Europe narrative. However, due to very different political structures and cultural foundations, the adaptation of social innovation in the region is very different. So over the coming months, we are bringing together practitioners from Asia to tell our stories and let the international communities to understand our voices. So today, I'm very excited to have two inspiring minds next to me, like on the screen, to share the experience and thoughts of everyday social innovation. First up, a leading figure in Taiwan who is increasingly well recognized across the globe, Audrey Tang, Digital Minister of the Taiwan government. As a Hong Konger myself, I admire what the Taiwanese government has done for social innovation in the past years, and Audrey and her team are all behind all these. She is the first digital minister of the Taiwan government. As a renowned civic hacker, she was actively participating in the Sunflower Student Movement and then was invited to be a reverse mentor, which is also known as an advisor to the cabinet. And in 2016, she was invited to be the first digital minister of the government, driving digital transformation and social innovation. So welcome, Audrey. And also, I'm very honored to be joined by our social innovation thought leaders, Jeff Morgan. Until last year, um, Jeff was the CEO of Nesta, the innovation foundation in the UK. And Jeff Morgan is also the professor of collective intelligence, public policy and social innovation at UCL, University College London. So Jeff has been one of the leading figure in the field of social innovation from theory to practice. And he also was the founder of SIX. So today he will share with us his thoughts on how social innovation can benefit the society. Okay, enough introduction. <laughs> like, welcome Jeff and Audrey. To start with, let me turn to Audrey. So Taiwan has been internationally recognized by the effort of combating the coronavirus, despite Taiwan and China are next to each other. And you have already done many in other interviews and articles describing what Taiwan has done. So rather than going over that again, today we would like to understand the contributing factors that make this possible. So as I know, fast, fair, and fun has been the major principles of the government response. So can you briefly explain to our audience today like um, what and how the Taiwan government come up with these principles and what do they look like in practice? So over to you, Audrey. Certainly. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, and can you hear me? Okay, that's great. Yeah, um, in Taiwan, um, 
we have a saying, um, I think it's a global saying that says, uh, anything that we're born with is human nature and anything that is uh, comes after we're born is technology. Uh, and in Taiwan, democracy definitely is a technology because our first presidential election is 1996, uh, well after actually internet and after the World Web. Um, and so I remember that internet and democracy, they're not two things. They are to us uh, the same thing, uh, the same era, the same bunch of people working on them. And so for us, democracy is a continuously evolving set of technology that improves as more people participate. And digital technology, which for Taiwan comes on the same year as technology, uh, remains one of the best ways to improve participation, as long as the focus is on finding common ground, common understanding, as we call it, and rough consensus in internet uh, culture speech, uh, instead of uh, division. And so uh, I'm really happy uh, that uh, I was able to take the culture that I've uh, immersed myself in, the internet governance culture that focus on rough consensus and running code and deploy it, so to speak, um, as a way to organize um, the fast, fair and fun principle. Uh, and the three principles are indeed key in countering the coronavirus uh, using the power of digital democracy. Social innovation, that is to say, people who participate from all walks of life in order to publicly benefit our society through novel ways of organizations is the cornerstone of our response system and is, is really fast. So I'll briefly show maybe one quick example of each pillar uh, just to illustrate the, the work. Uh, instead of doing screen sharing, I'll use a more personal uh, sharing method, which is like me holding a tablet uh, to the screen uh, and it should probably work. Right, so on the fast part, which which is collective intelligence. Uh, we literally rely on collective intelligence last year in last December when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted here uh, with pictures. Uh, and it did happen that there are seven <laughs> SARS uh, cases um, in, in, in Wuhan. Um, the uh, whistleblowing were reposted almost immediately uh, to the Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit, the PTT. Uh, while Li Wenliang uh, was getting inquiries and eventually punishments from his uh, institutions. At the same time, the PTT board uh, was upvoting this um, whistleblowing. Uh, and so our medical officers immediately noticed and issued an order that said all passengers flying from Wuhan need to start health inspection the next day, which was the first day of 2020. But I want to go a little bit deeper and say that PTT is just a bulletin board system, uh, like from the old dial-up days. Uh, and so um, it's very interesting that it's got a long tradition of a real-time synchronous com communication real-time upvoting and downvoting, and its own kind of governing system that has been making sure the signals gets upvoted and not the noise. And all of this has been uh, around since the early 90s, uh, actually since the late 80s. Uh, and so because it's a not-for-profit organization, not working for an advertiser or shareholders, uh, in fact, uh, maintained just by National Taiwan University students, um, it's a really open civil society that uh, uh, people trust uh, to uh, uh, upvote the signals. And because we have a, uh, according to Civicus Monitor, the most open society in the whole of Asia, um, although we enjoy the same freedom of speech, assembly, the press, and so on as other liberal democracies, with uh, social innovation uh, public forums like the PTT, the open novel ideas from the society gets escalated really quickly, and our medical officers are actually himself just lingering on PTT uh, in the wee hours. Uh, and that's why our schools and businesses uh, never went through a lockdown and still remain open today. Uh, and so the uh, Central Epidemic Command Center, this uh, kind of uh, live streamed um, daily press conference with this landline that everybody can dial 1922 to ask pretty much any question with a more than 90% immediate pickup rate uh, is like this synchronous uh, conversation that people can can give and take uh, for the uh, ideas that they want to share. For example, back in April, there was a young boy who said he doesn't want to go to school because when we're rationing masks, all he has is a pink medical mask and their school mates may laugh at him. And the very next day, every 
everybody in the Central Epidemic Command Center start wearing pink medical mask, uh, showing solidarity, gender mainstreaming. Uh, and also, suddenly, the boy is wearing the, the most hip mask, right? The, the masks that the uh, heroes wear. Uh, and, um, and, and so that makes sure that this builds a rapid trust between the government uh, and the civil society. And another focus is fairness. And by fairness, um, I need to introduce this interesting idea called G0V, uh, Gov0, G0V, the TW. Basically, for each government service, uh, which always end in .gov, .tw, um, people from the Gov0 movement can fork, that is to say, take it to a different direction while preserving its original content uh, in an open source way by uh, building an alternative vision of that government website. And so, for example, there is a participation website at join.gov.tw. But if you want to join the Gov0, it's join.g0v.tw. So there's no need to do an advertisement or some things like it. You just take a government website, change it out to a zero, and get into the shadow government. Um, and so uh, at a, um, when we're reaching the mask, uh, we're initially saying uh, we're going to go through the different pharmacies, making sure that people with their national health insurance cards can purchase uh, the medical masks from the pharmacies. But the problem is, of course, nobody knows which pharmacies near them still have masks in stock. Uh, without waiting for the government to come up with solutions, um, someone with the name uh, Howard Wood uh, just built this ma uh, mask map that can show very easily uh, which uh, pharmacy near you uh, still have masks, in which case they will be in green, or if they have a little bit, then in yellow, otherwise it will be in red. Uh, and so everybody can very easily navigate, uh, literally uh, navigate to the nearby pharmacies. Uh, and because we have more than 99.9% .9 of health coverage, people who show any symptom would then be able to take the medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing that they will get treated fairly without incurring any financial burden. But of course, almost immediately, people um, overwhelmed Howard Wu's uh, server, uh, and he owed uh, Google some 20K US dollars uh, because of the open a uh, the map API usage. Uh, and so he went to the Gov0 Slack channel uh, and say, um, I I'm finding myself owing Google a lot of money. Uh, what should I do? Uh, because he made national news. Uh, and then uh, we just brainstormed about ways to, to solve that. Of course, uh, there's technical ways to solve that. There's also political ways to solve that. Uh, so um, I actually just called Google, and we had this uh, chat that uh, basically said, we're going to open up the API. So instead of people um, reporting voluntarily the mask availability, like Ushahidi and other uh, uh, people-generated content, we will instead just have all the pharmacies automatically publish every 30 seconds, like a distributed ledger, uh, a ledger of the uh, real-time stock uh, level of all the pharmacies. And this is very interesting, because according to most of countries' Freedom of Information Acts, um, the numbers, statistics are going to be published maybe every day, every week, uh, and things like that, uh, in order to have people scrutinizing the numbers before publishing. But this is machine to machine publishing, that is to say, publishing upon collection. And so uh, everybody relies on everybody else in the queue to make sure that if you swipe your NHI card if you're adult, you expect the adult column to reduce by nine uh, in the next couple of minutes. If you're a child, you expect that number reduced by 10 in the next few minutes. And so this is participatory accountability. And and with more than 140 different tools, including chatbots, voice assistants for people with blindness and things like that, it's all very fair. Like people can participate and check it's fair without overly relying on the state or on any particular company's implementation. And Google eventually waived the fees uh, for, for how it would anyway. Uh, and so when the citizens uh, build dashboards like this showing oversupply and undersupply, uh, this is what we call a reverse procurement. The citizens uh, uh, build build up the specification, uh, like the map uh, or the allocation strategy, and the government just uh, implement what people want uh, the very next week uh, in the live streamed uh, press conference. And so this is not for the people. This is not with the people. This is after the people. That is to say the people have already uh, found out a better way. And we just made sure that they have the uh, resource for, the, for that to, to happen. And so based on this analysis, you can see our premier smiling happily here uh, because there's 20% uh, 
percent of people who do not have the uh, time to collect uh, masks from pharmacies because uh, they work very long hours after they uh, go off work. All the pharmacies close anyway, uh, and so we started partnering with convenience stores so that they can um, pre-order online uh, and pre-order also on the kiosk of the convenience stores and pick up those masks. All in all, more than ninety percent of people in Taiwan collected the mask, and the remaining nine uh, percent or so maybe they have a lot of masks already in their homes. They even use uh, demanded a feature that uh, tells us that we have to implement this uh, dedicating for international humanitarian aid feature so that they can dedicate their uncollected mass quotas uh, to the international audience and uh, choose to remain anonymous or reveal their names, which you can read all about in Taiwan can help that us. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's more than 700,000 dedicators uh, which donated more than five uh, million masks uh, this way. And so we ensure fairness of all kinds. And finally, I would like to stress that because it's a stressful time, people do feel anxious. And we have this twin problem of not just a pandemic, but also infodemic, that is to say panic buying, conspiracy theories, and so on. And so um, the idea of countering this information with humor, humor over rumor, uh, was not uh, designed for the pandemic alone. We used this very consistently because we found that fun spreads uh, much easier than outrage, uh, which is also uh, a emotion with a very high R value, but fun is even uh, have a even more high R value. Uh, and so that's what we call humor over rumor. And so when there's a panic buying of tissue papers, for example. There was a rumor that says, it's the same material as facial mask, and there was panic buying. And so the same premier smiling in the previous slide now shows his bottom and say in very large print that each of us only have one pair of Botox. Uh, and and it's, a, uh, it's a pun because in Mandarin, Botox and stockpiling sounds the same, all right, it's twin. Uh, and, and it's a table here says that the uh, uh, medical mask came from domestic materials and tissue paper from South American materials. Uh, and so this is so funny and packaged literally like a tissue paper package. Um, and so this is a much higher R value uh, than the panic buying conspiracy theory. And so that uh, rumor died down within a day or two. And finally, we found a person who spread rumor at the first place was tissue paper resellers. Uh, but this is not just a single shot thing, right? Every single scientific um, policy, like this physical distance, if you're indoor, you have to keep three spokes dog away from each other, outdoor two spokes dogs away, are translated by the spokes dog of the Central Epidemic Command Center, uh, which is actually the companion animal with our Ministry of Health and Welfare's uh, open uh, government participation officer. And so every time this ECC uh, have a press conference, introduce a new policy, they just go home and take a photo of the dog of, uh, you know, don't put your hand to your mouth, uh, pre-order the mask to keep you uh, safe from your own unwashed hands, uh, which is, uh, again, a really good incentive design if you think about it, because it's much, as an idea, much more worth spreading than, say, you wear a mask to protect others, um, like, uh, because this also reminds people to wash their hands properly. So, so that's the basic ideas, fast, fair, and fun, uh, and there's a lot more that you can read at Taiwan Can Help That Us. Thank you so much, Audrey, on like sharing like the principles. And I think it's really impressive, like when you talk about like the government actually is after the people. It's not with the people, it's not for the people, but after the people and believing that the people got the resources, got the intelligence already. And um, I, I'm sure it tells uh, and also reveals there a lot of uh, about trust, uh, about mm -hmm. trust building. Um, uh, uh, and, and also, it's impressive to see humor over rumor. It's really fun when I when I saw it on Facebook. It's really funny. Even a mm -hmm. Hong Konger like read that. Yeah, it's, like, it's, oh, hilarious. Yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, we'll get back to that. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'll um, go to Jeff. Um, so Jeff, um, since you have been working like in the field for a long time, um, so what do you? Th and also you have a lot of experience working with different governments. So what do you think are the cities or countries? can learn from Taiwan in building such uh, enabling conditions to leverage social innovation for a resilient societies like this. Can you share some of your thoughts? Yeah. 
Well, th thanks, Marco. And I, I, I always love hearing uh, Audrey talk about what's being done in Taiwan. There's a, you know, a, a, a lightness and an effectiveness, which is quite rare in governments tend to be heavy and ineffective. <laughs> and it's nice to see the opposite. So maybe I'll just put three, three sort of issues on the table, which I hope we, we can explore. So the first is, in a way, one which, you know, you, Marco and Audrey are, are very familiar with. I think there has been in the last not just few years, but few decades, a shift in the geography of social innovation. So more and more, we are looking not, as you said at the beginning, Marco, to, I don't know, UK or Germany or US. It is countries like Taiwan or Korea or Bangladesh or India, which in some ways are often leapfrogging ahead of the, the West uh, in both technology, but also their social uses. And the COVID crisis has really accelerated that dramatically, as we've seen the UK and the US amongst the worst performers globally, uh, but also France and Spain uh, and Italy. Whereas in Asia, it's not just Taiwan and Korea, but also Vietnam and many other countries doing dramatically better in reducing infections and death rates. So for the first time in my life, as it were, the Western world, which is usually a bit arrogant, <laughs> is actually having to be humble and learn from uh, other parts of the world which have jumped ahead. So I think this is an irreversible shift in almost the psychological geography of the world. The second thing I wanted to explore is, is one of the really interesting aspects of the Taiwan experience, um, which is how you combine being very open and very inclusive and very discursive with also being very decisive. Because I think many people are brought up to assume either you have authoritarian governments which get things done, make decisions quickly, cope in a crisis, or you have an open consultative democracy, but it takes a long time and it can't cope with uh, difficult decisions. Again, one of the fascinating things about the last few months is we've seen in quite a few countries a very democratic uh, leaderships which have been simultaneously uh, very open, very trusting of the public, rather than just demanding that the public trust them, but also decisive. So, well, Audrey can talk about Taiwan, but I would say Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand has done that really well, uh, has shown that sort of spirit of open decisiveness. In a different way, Angela Merkel in Germany has had a very open process on the science, on the issues, very decentralized, but also decisive. And I hope this is getting us away from that kind of mental model, which I think many people have, which is, as I say, authoritarian decisiveness or democratic dithering as the only two options. Uh, and, uh, and it'd be good to hear about how you've managed to design that in Taiwan so that your very open processes don't take forever. And then the third issue really is, uh, you know, it follows on from what Audrey was saying earlier. Are we beginning to see almost a different vision of where the state could evolve in the next 5, 10, 20 years? A very different vision from what we had in the past or what we, most of us have now. So, for example, much more open data on everything from supplies in pharmacists to perhaps uh, how the infrastructure is run to government itself. This is, we're still in the early days of governments really opening themselves inside out making all of that data into a commons, into a shared resource. Linked to that is, as it were, an idea where government almost fuses with civil society. So you can sometimes perhaps no longer see quite the boundaries between the state and society as they do things both with each other, but as you say, sometimes society ahead of government and government like in reverse procurement acting very differently. The things which Taiwan has been innovating around democracy and v Taiwan, again, feel like almost a different vision of the state where the collective intelligence of the society is absolutely sort of built in to almost the DNA of how the state functions. So I'd like to hear a little bit more from Audrey, sort of thinking 10, five or 10 years ahead to where all of these things might be as a really a, a different vision of, of the, the state and very different from what we've grown up with in countries like the UK or the US or Brazil for that matter, where in a way the military security origins of the state are very visible <laughs> still. It's, it's sort of essence is as a monopolist of coercion, uh, the place which protects you militarily against others. 
And this is almost, it is the social innovation vision of where the state would go. And then just one final comment. It so relates to, to fun, I guess, is the other is humility. I think one of the really fascinating things I think the history books will say about 2020 is that the arrogant, pompous leaders, Bolsonaro, Trump and others, have really been found out. Whereas those leaders who are a bit more humble, both humble in relation to biology, because this is fundamentally a biological <laughs> fact, COVID, but also humble in relation to their own people, have done much better. And I hope, you know, the, the publics of the world will be much more skeptical of the arrogant and pompous leaders in the future than perhaps they have been in the past. So there's just a few things to, to get us going. Thank you, Jeff. Maybe, maybe Audrey can respond a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So there's two specific questions, if I hear correctly. Uh, one is about uh, how do Taiwan communicate uh, its open decisiveness? Is this a by deliberate design? Is this part of culture? Uh, or what makes this open decisiveness work? Uh, it couldn't just be biology. Uh, by uh, you know virtue of having uh, a lady president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, just as in New Zealand or in Germany, um, like biology doesn't explain everything <laughs> so so maybe there, there's more to it so that's the first question and a second question is about a vision of how the state functions if the government uh, sees itself as after the people what's its logical conclusion some five or ten years down the line so that's the two questions that I hear um, the, the first one I think it's it's really important to think about the, the uh, iteration cycle the speed about which that people's input be become policy. In traditional procurement, that would easily take a quarter, and that's considered fast. Uh, but in reverse procurement, that's like 24 hours. Um, if people already agree that it's a good idea, it's legitimized. And if the economic sector says that they are willing to work with the norms set by the social sector already, then the public sector has really just to say that, OK, in our daily press conference, we will let everybody find out about this great idea idea. That's literally the only thing we need to do. Um, and so because the public sector's work is minimized, the risk is minimized because it's already legitimized by the social sector. Uh, and also the trustworthiness is already earned because of the previous responses, like the pink medical mask episode. Uh, and so the, the government is um, really like uh, working as a kind of amplifier of what's already uh, innovative about the society. But it does require, I think it's not just about trusting the people or uh, making ourselves uh, transparent to the people, but also what I would call radical accountability. That is to say, be uh, prepared to provide each and every, in each and every step, a account of why we're promoting this idea, why we're doing this wax. Uh, and this goes beyond traditional open data and freedom of information, which is mostly about the decisions already made and system already built. This is about uh, while we are clueless about how to do things, what's our thought process? Uh, and uh, my like open office hours, where everybody, uh, every Wednesday, nowadays it's like two days a week now, um, can just visit me uh, because I work in a park, literally a park, the Social Innovation Lab in, in in Taipei. Um, anyone can just go into this very uh, fun looking uh, soccer field uh, actually drawn by people with trisomy differences with people with Down syndrome who are kind of natural creative artists uh, and there's no walls. It used to be a Air Force uh, castle-like structure but we tore down all the walls so I'm working in the park literally and you can see very transparently that I'm uh, working, I'm walking actually very predictably every day to the social innovation at, and back so people can just grab me and, and talk uh, or knock at the door and and talk uh, or uh, book 40 minutes of my time and everything they, they want to uh, ask, uh, I'm accountable to them. I need to explain uh, why am I feeling uh, sure about this or unsure about this and what's my current take on things. And because I insist on putting into the internet as creative commons uh, everything uh, that people ask and how my, I answer, it kind of builds on each other so that through the transcript and the uh, video footages, people would ask deeper and deeper questions. And the traditional lobbyists who lobby for their own 
benefit may be at the expense of the society simply leaves me alone because um, they know that this will be radically transparent anyway. Uh, and so uh, the radical accountability, I think, um, is even more important than transparency after the fact. Uh, this is the transparency in the stage of uh, our own unsureness. And that invites people to do agenda setting on a very early stage. And so that is partly also the answer of the vision of the state, maybe five or 10 years down the line. We can easily imagine that a society evolves such that people can feel the, the wholeness, the, the oneness uh, of the, the planet as people are currently feeling, like uh, no matter where you are in the world, even though previously you feel maybe climate change is two generations down the line because I'm on a really large island or things like that, um, you, you can't help but feel that pandemic connects uh, to everybody together. Everybody, every place is just two months away from every other place in terms of the outbreak of development. And so uh, I think uh, people with the kind of reflection of this um, holistic view on the planet and on the social um, dynamics about those structural issues, about a virus that doesn't respect the national boundaries, nor um, infodemic actually, nor carbon uh, footprint. Uh, and they will learn, I think, uh, to become much more humble around each other and then uh, in the same time scale to work in a uh, way that leaves no one behind, basically. That's the vision of sustainability. And uh, previously, one can kind of um, seclude uh, oneself uh, in a kind of hedonistic cycle and ignore <laughs> the people that have been left behind. But the experience in Taiwan in the COVID teaches us that as long as there are any place in Taiwan that's not safe, the entire population is not safe. As long as there's any place in us that's not safe, Taiwan is not safe. So, so that's the whole point of sharing the Taiwan model to the world. Maybe just, just two, two, can I make just two quick comments on that? So one is um, this idea of opening up the thought processes of the state before decisions. Um, uh, I had a sort of experience of this 20 years ago when I ran the government strategy unit. We had media people who were very nervous about ever showing anything until it was completely polished and finished and a, was a press release. And we did the exact opposite. We published all of our work programs, our early stage working papers, our thoughts in progress, everything was on the internet. And it turned out the media just got bored because there was no such thing as a leak anymore because if you make everything transparent, it's not kind of exciting to find the secret leak of what the government is up to. And it means you can tap into the expertise of hundreds or thousands of people early on, which often tells you you're doing something really stupid. Uh, and it was so obviously a more intelligent way of running government, but it didn't stick. It, it lasted three or four years. And then, as it were, government re defaulted back to its ha habits of secrecy and control, but then leads to bad policy bad decisions. And we never had any problems from this, our version of radical transparency literally never created any major, major issues. And just want a cultural question for Audrey. So when the crisis began, and it became clear that countries like Taiwan were doing so much better than Italy or the UK, the media here said, ah, of course they can do this because they are essentially authoritarian societies. They are, you know, they're used to having <laughs> military dictatorships, the public do whatever they're told. And so that was the lens through which everything was interpreted. But you're saying almost an, an opposite description of that, that's right if it's an authoritarian society we wouldn't occupy the parliament right and then export that technology to hong kong later that year so <laughs> so so um i think uh taiwan uh, of course people remember our authoritarian past uh, but it also strengthens our resolve to never go back there Right, so with marriage equality, uh, with open innovations, people are learning to to see Taiwan uh, in a different light. Uh, and uh, if you ask random people on the street, like about wearing a mask, they will say that the CECC is too slow, the Central Epic Command Center. They tell us to wear a mask and we wear a mask, but even when they tell us there's no need to wear a mask, for example, outdoors uh, and with uh, sufficient physical distance, we wear a mask anyway. Uh, and so this is not about being, 
conforming at all. This is about uh, a rational design, like uh, in the quarantine hotels, which uh, ensure hotel has pretty good business, even if they don't have international tourists as much. Um, if, if people don't like quarantine hotel, if they choose to remain home, uh, if they live with a, a no vulnerable group of people, they can choose to go through the 14 day quarantine in their own home, but with the digital fence. And the digital fence is like the number one example that when people point to Taiwan and say digital fence, they say, oh, they're authoritarian, they're doing this GPS tracking uh, <laughs> right, to, to massive population, um, which is, of course, disinformation or just misinformed. Um, that we, we don't collect any GPS. There's no app introduced. Uh, there's no um, Bluetooth technology, nothing like that, right? So what we do essentially is that using cell phone tower triangulation, which is a cell phone strength signal no, already collected uh, about a 50 meter radius at most. Um, if your phone goes out of that range during the 14 day quarantine, there's an automated SMS, just like an earthquake warning or things like that, or a heavy flood warning that's sent uh, to the local police, uh, which uh, will make sure that uh, you do not actually break uh, the quarantine. Uh, and uh, it's all rational choice, right? Uh, if you stay in a quarantine every day, uh, we pay you 33 US dollars as a stipend. If you break the quarantine, you pay us 1,000 times that. You can support <laughs> 1,000 uh, other people, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, by the end of the quarantine, there's no constitutional basis on us to, to keep sending those SMS. So we just don't do that, right? So the point is that we never declare as uh, an emergency situation. So everything we do need to be accountable, not only to the press, but also to the MPs and to everybody who uh, cares to call 1922 and demand an explanation of how the digital fence works. And that's why people work with them, not because they're conforming, but rather it's a rational thing to do if you have a single payer universal health system, um, even if you're not diagnosed with COVID, uh, if you develop similar symptoms, you will pick up a mask and go to a local clinic because there's no financial or social burden to do so. Can, can I ask just two, two, two other little questions? Well, they're quite big questions, Audrey. Um, so, uh, one is just a little bit, if you could just say a little bit about how you've embedded social innovation into government machinery departments and so on, because I think that is something very different from what the rest of the world has done. And then just going back to this question of the, the, the nature of government in five or 10 years time, uh, as climate change hopefully becomes much more prominent again on the agenda, um, how would some of these tools you've described be used perhaps to help a whole population reduce carbon emissions, make sure they're not, you know, being uh, damaging through their driving or their house? You know, how do we use data, shared new platforms, transparency to really ratchet up effectiveness on climate change, not just on COVID? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I can make this kind of a seminar topic for three day uh, conferences, but instead I'll talk in three minutes chunks, I guess. So um, let, let's see. Um, one of the, the uh, main thing about the Taiwan parliament uh, is that uh, not only it's quite gender balanced, uh, more than 40% women, but also very age balanced. Uh, and so this ensures not only an intergenerational and uh, transcultural solidarity, but also uh, people there uh, look at uh, these emerging issues uh, with fresh eyes. And it wasn't always like this. Uh, and when uh, the MPs refused to deliberate substantially the cross-strait service and trade agreement in 2014, as I alluded to, people just occupied the parliament and did the MPs job for them because they were on strike. Uh, and so um, so that's, that's the point, right? The point is that there's always an outside game uh, and there's some MPs who came from the Sunflower Movement. Some MPs came from the earlier Wild Lily Movement uh, in 1990, which are all non-violent flowery uh, movements that peacefully transitioned uh, the institutions into democracy. Uh, but also there's always this implicit threat that if the uh, MPs are not providing this kind of fresh, um, real-time, emergent look at things and signing on the Open Government Partnership, Open Parliament, uh, multi-stakeholder forum, uh, they beat us to it. Uh, the, the administration, uh, Open Government, uh, multi-stakeholder forum is still in a uh, premier's office at this moment, uh, but the uh, parliament signed it uh, today. So in any case, if they don't do Open Government as a norm, then there's always a chance 
once that the parliament gets occupied again. And that outside game uh, really keeps everybody honest and not pompous. So that's the, the first answer. The, the second thing uh, I think uh, is really when I alluded to like 10 years uh, down the line, people will reflect the, the whole environment in a holistic way. I mean that um, like corporate personhood, uh, which is a interesting uh, way of looking at like legal nonfiction, I guess, uh, of corporations, uh, we are seeing much more uh, analogies of that being extended to, for example, in New Zealand, uh, the Wananui River is uh, a natural personhood. Um, so a natural environment safeguarded by data uh, and uh, people from the indigenous community and also from the government uh, making its case in board meetings representing the river's best interest uh, as a legal person and we have seen that extending other jurisdictions to entire forestry and things like that so um, my job description says that when we see the internet of things let's make it an internet of beings and that's what i'm referring to a internet of trees a internet of rivers and things like that uh, that would uh, give them a seat at the table and also future generations of sentient beings a seat at the table and i think these are the kind of uh, um, distributed ledgers that can really help because when people participate in curating those data and in producing those data as in Taiwan, the digital ledger is used to measure air quality, but also water quality and things like that. People naturally give, um, if you have watched the movie Avatar, you know what I'm talking about, imbue a kind of person with a spirit uh, into the natural environment. And then we can then reason uh, about its best interest uh, in a way that we previously wouldn't be able to do in traditional representative democracy. Hmm. Thank you, Audrey. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, so um, this is a dialogue between us and also with the people. Um, so there are um, many people watching YouTube live together with us now. So uh, I invite all the audience who are watching live now, please uh, put your questions in the comment section and we'll um, give it to Jeff and Audrey to answer later. So to start with, actually, um, I would like to ask Audrey, um, so you talk about your job description just now, and you put great emphasis on people. So um, so this is your job uh, description. And so I, I, I'm very interested, like how do you integrate these in your daily work and infiltrate to influence the civil servant that you guys are working with to have this kind of mindset change? Of course, you mentioned there are um, the outside force, like the movement, the civil society. Um, so how, how does that really work to, to influence them? And I'm, I know you have uh, set up a, a, a role in each of the department. Maybe you can explain a little bit more about that. Thank you. Sure, uh, that's the participation officer network that I referred to, right? So in each and every ministry, there's a team of people uh, that engages people who have emergent uh, issues to talk about. And this is just like the traditional roles of media officers or uh, parliamentary officers, because traditionally uh, the, the large uh, mainstream press or the various councils in the parliament represent different uh, interest groups' interest, right? They're basically Basically, the kind of knots uh, in within the uh, public institution that represents, for example, economic development on one side and environmental sustainability on the other, or um, technological innovation on one side and social justice on the other. There's any number of configuration, and the public service traditionally is this rope uh, in the middle uh, that tries not to break uh, and <laughs> tries to make sure that the people can see themselves uh, eye to eye, but remains largely anonymous and absorb all the tensions and that uh, arbitrates between those kind of zero-sum-ish uh, game positions and trying very hard to deliver uh, public service despite those uh, competing interests. But there's a social innovation that uh, kind of breaks this model and this is the great social innovation that is called the hashtag, literally the hashtag symbol. Uh, and uh, with the right hashtag, you can mobilize any number of people without 
any um, representative, without any uh, top-down organization. Uh, and so when there's an emergent hashtag, there's no media officer or uh, parliamentary officer to talk to that hashtag, because how do you find a person who um, um, are the avatar, the spokesperson of the hashtag? You can't, right? So you need a different sort of officer, the participation officer, that can talk to the hashtag, literally. So when there's a hashtag that, that says, you know, the tax filing experience is explosively hostile to the users. Um, the participation officer from the Ministry of uh, Finance uh, has to join the conversation, join the fray, and say everybody in this thread uh, are cordially invited uh, to visit the uh, Ministry of Finance next week, so we can co-design the tax funding experience of next year together. Uh, and so just by posting this, and of course I support it saying this is authentic, like the uh, actually um, a, a officer, not a imposter. Uh, and anyway, so um, people really changed their, their ways of talking. Uh, previously there was like 80% sharp critique, uh, trolling, toxic uh, comments, only less than 20% offering constructive words. But after we say, okay, everybody who trolls or complains, you're cordially invited. Uh, then 80% of people actually start offering very constructive uh, uh, suggestions of how things may go. And so this is the, the idea of uh, admitting that we don't know. Uh, and then inviting people who know better uh, to start working together to, to co-create. Uh, in my TED talk, uh, I said that through the four uh, co-creation workshops, we created a tax funding experience that has more than 96% approval rate, which is unheard of uh, in Taiwan's digital service. And that's because 5,000 or more people uh, participated uh, sometime online or offline, and they can po point to one feature and say, I contributed to that feature. And then there's a YouTube comment uh, in TED.com that says, oh, so people complain about your government get sent to co-creation workshops. What a euphemism. Uh, and so, <laughs> right, so, so of course, um, so it, it's actually hard for people to, to imagine this kind of, kind of rapid um, response. But uh, in Taiwan, in initially, like four years ago, it was met with a lot of suspicion <laughs> and uncertainty and doubt as well. But nowadays, because we do this kind of invited real co-creation workshops, not concentration camps, uh, in uh, very regularly, every other week or so. Uh, and so it just become part of the uh, government's uh, regular dialogue with the um, civil society. And that became kind of a norm around the political process. And so that is how we can make sure that those participation officers uh, can engage any trending hashtag pink mask or not. Thank you. That's really impressive to have such a role like in in between people and the government and also really communicate what people um, really want. Um, so we have some questions from the audience um, because um, there are quite a number of crowds from Hong Kong. So there are some questions um, around uh, democracy also. So um, some of, uh, I try to synthesize some of the questions. So since Jeff and Audrey, you guys both live in a democratic society and the citizens understand they have a voice, they can participate in the change making process. So that's why like Jeff, you were successful in pushing the neighborhood innovation actions at Nestor and Young Foundation. And Audrey, you can do something with like digital social innovation and PDIS platform, but in a society like Hong Kong, like civil society often doubts their ability to change. And some of them become rather cynical and helpless easily. So uh, maybe they would say, oh, this cannot be done. Uh, they would never listen to me. So um, what are the successful cases or methods that we could use to rise up the intellig collective intelligence of the communities to believe that they uh, can be part of the change? And in such a polarized society, not just Hong Kong, I believe like many other countries also, what would you advise or what are some thoughts that you have that people and can be part of the change making process? So open to you guys. Uh, maybe Jeff first. <laughs> so I don't have any easy answers to this question. Maybe just one, one bit of encourage, well, encouragement. So I, I do a lot of work at the moment in Finland, and I've often found Finland a really interesting country to work in and very innovative on many fronts. If you look at the history of Finland, Finland was sat next to the USSR and had wars, had several wars with the USSR. 
and really for the last 70 years had to be very clever about using, about finding where there was power, where there was room for maneuver next to a far bigger, far more powerful military threatening monster, actually, in the case of the USSR. And they just became very, in a some sense, smart about knowing what battles you could fight or what battles you couldn't fight, but found a space to become what is now the most admired society on the planet, even more than Taiwan, in fact. Uh, you know, if you ask people what is the most... Uh, uh, um, you know, a successful country. Often Finland comes top. And no one would have guessed that 50 or 60 years ago because it looked hopeless. Uh, but they had to be very, very smart. I mean, the more you are in a constrained situation, the cleverer you have to be. There is a question I wanted to ask Audrey, which maybe slightly relates to that. Maybe it's a bit, uh, which is just on this issue of how you cope with the enemies of collective intelligence and democracy. So misinformation, disinformation, gaming, trolling. You started mentioning some of those, but it is a big issue in any more open system. How do you make sure you don't get manipulated, whether it's by the FSB in Russia or the Chinese or whoever else, or, or big interests? Mm -hmm. um, this is always going to be a bit of a, a challenge, how you fight hard against yeah, the enemies of, of, of collective intelligence. Sure. Uh, so, um, of course, I already talked about the timely response. Uh, on average, uh, 60 minutes after every trending uh, rumor, um, misinformation or not, uh, we roll out this funny messages uh, that contains, um, you know, 20 um, or so uh, letters, uh, characters in its title and less than 200 characters uh, in its body and always with two or more pictures. Um, and so the idea, very simply put, uh, is to get the clarification is more viral uh, than the uh, disinformation. Uh, and in Taiwan, disinformation has a legal definition, which is intentional untruths that causes public harm. So not causing like harm to the image of a minister, which is just good journalism, but actually causing public harm. Uh, and of course, the one about tissue paper uh, qualifies as public harm. Uh, and uh, we just wrote out very funny messages. Um, this one also from the premier is a, a gem. Uh, it says, um, there's a rumor that says, if you perm your hair many times uh, during seven days, then the government will fine you one million NT dollars. That's of course not true. Um, and then this is a photo uh, of the premier when he was young. And it says in very clear words that even though I'm bald now, I will not punish people who look like my youth. Uh, and then a uh, fine print that says what we have actually introduced is by 2021, the ingredients uh, need to be marked on the perming products. And then the premier, as he looks now, says also very clearly, that, however, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your pocket, but it will damage your hair. And just look at me now um, for what will happen to you. Uh, and so th th this kind of mimetic engineering of humor over rumor um, makes fun of themselves makes fun of uh, things that are harmless or mostly harmless. It's not about uh, pump being pompous. This is not being, uh, you know, alienating parts of the society or othering others. So this is like good humor, like what humor is supposed to mean. Uh, and this has really good um, virality of things. And this is uh, joined by the professional uh, international fact-checking uh, network, including the Town Fact-Checking Center uh, and uh, Michael Penn and so on. So this is just like, counter spam. Uh, if people get into a habit of flagging incoming spam, a spam, and then to spam house uh, or other like IFC and other like entities, eventually <coughs> the counter spam community gathers sufficient signal so that uh, each new email a spammer sends lands to your junk mailbox instead of your inbox. So unless you uh, have too much time, uh, you wouldn't probably spend a lot of time on your uh, spam box. And that's uh, these incentivizes people working on spamming. And so exactly the same thing is happening on clarification and things like that. But uh, that's, uh, that said, it, this methodology have two obvious limits. Uh, one is the hyper-precision targeting uh, that the social media, uh, some social media, some um, less pro-social media uh, offers, uh, especially during elections, because if you 
you do hyper targeting, not sufficient people will look at it and flag something as spam for this time of real time flag. Um, so in Taiwan, we have a separate branch of the government called the Jian Cha Yuan or the control branch. And the control branch takes care of publishing the campaign donation expense as raw data open data, structured data, uh, so everybody can do its own analysis on how election went. And based on the analysis of the mayoral election, we discovered that a large swath of campaign donation and expenditures went nowhere because it went to those uh, uh, hyper-targeted advertisement, which would, did not need to be declared because they were, uh, theoretically speaking, overseas companies. And so uh, we talked to the large platforms and say, look, this is the norm in Taiwan that we publish uh, the each and every um, campaign donation expense raw data. So you have two choices. One, you can also publish this real-time advertisement in as library, the same format with the same transparency, and limit the donation to uh, local citizens, uh, because according to our law, uh, foreigners are not allowed to donate to a campaign. Uh, you either do that, like conforming to the, the norm of the society, or you can simply refrain to run political advertisement during our elections. Um, and so uh, Google and Twitter uh, chose to not run political ads. Facebook chose to disclose uh, so that dark patterns um, will be discovered and shamed. <laughs> and so nobody dare to try dark patterns. And, and that works uh, admirably well. So that's about the norm first negotiation uh, with the multinational companies. And the other is about, you know, mal information, like things that are deliberately done in a kind of info op kind of way. And there's something uh, related to Hong Kong, actually, that was trending a little bit on uh, Taiwanese social media last November that says, Hong Kong, um, and I quote, Hong Kong thugs compensation exposed, kill a police and earn up to 20 million, unquote. Uh, and so um, it posted this uh, photo which is a real Reuters photo, by the way, uh, but it talks nothing about it being paid or things like that. But the uh, uh, social media said that this 13 year uh, is being paid to buy iPhones, recruiting his brother and things like that. And for that, we, we don't do a takedown because if we do a takedown, people miss the chance to learn and just repackaging a little bit, it will go viral again. Instead, we do a attribution, that is to say, uh, notice and public notice. So the International Fact Checking Network traced the original post of that picture with the wrong caption uh, to uh, the Chang'an sort, the Zhongyang Zhenfa with Weibo. And so instead of taking down anything, we just make sure that on social media, when you share this, um, a uh, public notice shows automatically that says this is essentially sponsored by Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei, who, who first posted it on, on their Weibo. So it's a, a case of state propaganda, basically. So um, I think the point is not to take down it from circulation, is to make sure that people look at these things with the right frame of the mind so that they still share it, but they now understand that this state propaganda, and that is important too. That sounds um, really impressive for, we are talking about like media literacy of the citizens, like how to train them to identify what is true, what is false, and who, what are the sources of, of the information. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, but in Taiwan, we don't say media literacy. We say media competence. And the okay. difference is that when you say literacy, you assume people consume media, uh, consume data, consume uh, writings, consume things, uh, digital creations. But if you say media competence, which we put in the curriculum starting from the first grade, actually, uh, we assume that they are producers of media and producers of data, curators of data, so that uh, they learn exactly the same thing as a journalist would learn, that is to say fact checking, the framing effect and things like that. And we expect them to actually participate in the crowdsourced fact checking, for example, leading up to the presidential election. So if they have worked hand to hand with journalists and learn a little bit of uh, journalism, just like after the daily uh, press conference from the CECC after three months, everybody become kind of amateur epidemiologist and can explain a little bit of the science behind it. That makes sure that people, instead of saying, you know, this is right, this is wrong, they would be able and to form their own creative ways to further journalism. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious about time. I'm, I'm sure we can um, go over a few minutes. So there's one question that I want to highlight. Um, um, so actually, when we talk about social innovation, we talk about a lot um, cross-sectoral collaboration, other than the public sector, the social sector, 
but also the private sector, of course, like Google, uh, that the, the case that Audrey just mentioned, Google waived the charge and everything. So one question from the audience um, asks, like um, uh, to Audrey, like we t when you talk about the internet of beings, like human representing the interests of the nature, like how do you think it can start in Taiwan? And also, and the second question is, how do you think corporates can um, can play a role in it um, in social innovation? So maybe you can share some mm -hmm. of the ideas. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, I think uh, one of the main thing is to change the way we, we use words. Um, one of the, the um, word changes to when I work uh, with Silicon Valley companies is around the term user, uh, because it kind of assumes that you want more fractions of the attention, like a limited budget that can, they, they can spend. I mean, some other industry also use the term user uh, in pretty much the same way about making them addicted. Uh, and so the, the point here is that uh, if you think about uh, users as merely users and not your co-creators, and there's a limit of which uh, that the companies can do uh, because it's uh, framed in a kind of pre-existing relationship. It's only when you think of, of people as fellow human beings that can co-create, uh, can the companies kind of break out of their mold and join this purpose uh, first, but also with um, uh, profit, of course, uh, but instead of uh, profit first uh, and with purpose uh, way of thinking. So uh, it may be uh, good to just read my full uh, job description, which is about this kind of translation between different metaphors and goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. That's, that's really amazing. So um, uh, one, uh, I think uh, it's seven already. Um, so, um, so maybe you guys, uh, Jeff and Audrey, um, now the world is in a chaotic situation because of the pandemic and also world politics. And we, when we talk about social innovation, like people will, might be feeling a little bit learned helplessness, like, oh, so how can we change? And they might feel small, especially in the COVID situation, the state power in some countries like become really vague. So maybe um, some of your advice or, or, or words of encouragement to the people who are social innovators in their own context like what you what would you say to them as a final final word? Shall, shall I shall I kick off and maybe maybe three final things? So first of all, uh, I mean Audrey hasn't talked a lot about hacking, but actually I, I did a, a session yesterday with a whole load of people in Brazil, which has a pretty terrible government at the moment. Uh, but in a way, what they're trying to do from the grassroots is hacking together, often using technologies to create community level platforms for sharing food or visits, sorting things out, not waiting for government. And I think this is actually an era when some of that hacker mentality comes into its own because of the nature of the crisis, even if you have a really big, terrible government. The second thought really prompted by a lot of what Audrey said is really about perhaps a a common theme often of social innovation is inverting things, turning them upside down. So in the way that, you know, the Grameen Bank and BRAC turned farmers into bankers, uh, a lot of what you've been talking about is inverting things. So like the communications team in a government, instead of them communicating only outwards, thinking of them as listening, thinking of intelligence, not as something which again, the state gathers in and hoards, but rather something which is shared and turning the user into a co-creator. There are many, many other metaphors like this where inverting things opens up all sorts of uh, all sorts of new possibilities. And then the final thought, I mean, in a way, this is where Audrey is uh, such an interesting example, is sometimes social innovators do have to engage in politics, create political parties, infiltrate political parties. Because at some point, if you're not willing to play that game of engaging with state power, it's really quite hard to achieve truly transformative change. So I hope part of the inspiration of hearing Audrey talk is really thinking about how, and it may be difficult in Hong Kong, I admit, <laughs> but in some contexts, you know, social innovators can really achieve a lot 
by getting into politics. Often people are frightened of politics. They think it's dangerous and dirty. But at some points, you have to get engaged with state power if you really want to transform the world. That, that's great. Uh, and I totally agree about this almost like Taiwanese reversal, right? Reverse mentorship, reverse procurement. Uh, so in democratic Taiwan, ministers trust you, right? Uh, and things like that. So uh, I think it is important uh, to think uh, the current crisis as a way of uh, new forms of social organizations uh, gaining legitimacy from the grassroots, from unlikely places. Uh, there's some resemblance of uh, comparing it to the financial crisis about uh, 12 years ago. And so I think novel ways of social organization um, really has its um, opportunity to rise if people learn to organize well. And um, actually Hong Kong has a lot to, to teach from LIHKG and many <laughs> like be water strategies of how people can um, be uh, really not really decentralized like poly centered with like more than 20,000 different leaders at any given time and and that can really teach the world one thing or two uh, as for the kind of final thoughts to to share with people who are social innovators um, I will just quote uh, my favorite poem uh, from uh, Lena Cohen uh, anthem uh, very quickly and it goes like this um, the birds they sang at the break of day start again I hear them say don't dwell on what has passed away or what is yet to be. Yet the wars, they will be fought again. The holy dove, she will be caught again. Bought and sold and bought again. The dove is never free. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. Thank you. Live long, prosper. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you for the lovely poem. And actually, I have to admit, the last sentence of that poem is always on my Instagram or is in my, on my wall. Like, yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you for the words of encouragement. And so um, we have had a very fruitful hour. And thank you very much to Audrey and Jeff for sharing your experience and thought with us. Um, in driving cross-sectoral collaboration and social innovation. And I'm sure after the pandemic, the 16 wishes to visit Audrey and your team and bring some of our international friends to Taiwan. And thank you all who attend today in YouTube Live and, and for your thoughtful questions. Um, so in the coming months, we are, going, uh, we are committed to build Asia's social innovation narrative. And this series will continue to bridge the Asian SI players to the international platform and promote exchange and conversation between thinkers and doers around the world. So join us for future conversations and dialogue with brilliant people in our global exchange and stay tuned for more. So visit us in our uh, website and follow us on our social media and write to us if you have any other great ideas to collaborate. And, and at this point, I want to acknowledge one of my friends in Taiwan, um, Oliver um, from Impact Hub Taipei for facilitating this to happen. So uh, thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Jeff. And have a great day for those. And for those in Asia, have a restful mm -hmm. evening. Yeah, have a good local time. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye.